Hello, welcome back to Community Bible Study. Please join us tonight as we look at John chapter 19, verses 17 through 42. As we always do, let's open in a prayer. <clears throat> Father, thanks for being with us. Thanks for giving us your word. Thanks especially for arranging that we would study these verses, these chapters in the last week of Jesus' life, the last day of Jesus' life, the last hours of Jesus' life as a man here on earth. As we here in this year approach Easter Sunday. So Father, we ask that you be with us, that you supernaturally uh, change the words that I might say to to be words that you would have said that that each of us would hear your word and take it to heart. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I prayed, as we as we approach Easter each year, the glory of Easter Sunday, we know that we must first revisit Good Friday. I'm sure you've thought about that Good Friday. Good. What do you mean good? How do we call a day good when our Savior and our Lord is crucified on a cross? I think maybe it's because the man Jesus of Nazareth was born to die, to die for us. Jesus lived and died for you and me. I read one time that Buddha on his deathbed said, And now, O priests, I take my leave of you. All of life is transitory. Work out your salvation with diligence. In contrast, Jesus said to Martha and to us, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In John's gospel, we're in the last hours of Jesus' life as a, as a man here on earth. Last night, last night in our story, Jesus endured six trials, six civil trials, uh, six criminal trials, Six Jewish trials, six Roman trials, and then he endured flogging, a punishment that brings a man next to death. And then the Bible says, and Pilate handed him over to be crucified. I think Max Lucado in his book, Six Hours from One Friday, sets the scene for us well. Six Hours One Friday. To the casual observer, the six hours are mundane. A shepherd with his sheep, a housewife with her thoughts, a doctor with his patients. But to the handful of awestruck witnesses, the most maddening of miracles is occurring. God is on a cross. The creator of the universe is being executed. Spit and blood are caked to his cheeks and his lips are cracked and swollen. Thorns rip his scalp. His lungs scream with pain, his legs not with cramps, taut nerves threaten to snap as pain twangs her morbid melody, yet death is not ready. And there is no one to save him, he is sacrificing himself. It is no normal six hours, it is no normal Friday. Far worse than the breaking of his body is the shredding of his heart. His own countrymen clamored for his death. His own disciple planted the kiss of betrayal. His own friends ran for cover. And now his own father is beginning to turn his back, leaving him alone. A witness could not help but ask, Jesus, do you give no thought to saving yourself? What keeps you there? What holds you to the cross? Nails don't hold gods to trees. What makes you stay? What does that Friday mean? For the life blackened with failure, that Friday means forgiveness. 
For the heart scarred with futility, that Friday means love. For the soul looking into this side of the tunnel of death, that Friday means salvation. Six hours, one Friday. What do you do with those six hours, one Friday? For us in tonight's lesson, I want to talk about seven words from Jesus, seven words uttered by Jesus during six hours one Friday. We'll ask what, as we always do, and we'll look at the seven last words of Christ. We'll ask, so what? What do these words mean for us? And then we'll ask, now what? What do we do with Jesus' last words? Our story picks up in John chapter 19, at verse 16, really. Finally, Pilate handed them over, handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. That's it. That's simple. Unlike the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, or excuse me, The Last Passion of the Christ, John doesn't focus on the agony of Jesus' crucifixion. I think his purpose is to present Jesus in his majesty, glory, and sovereignty. If you want to know about the crucifixion and the agony on the cross, you need only look at the Journal of the American Medical Association edition on March 21, 1986. Good luck on reading that without cringing. John's purpose is not to arouse pity or anger. To, to John, it's not so important how it happened, but that it happened. I think his description is the so what to his gospel. Sometimes we don't know what to make of the cross. We hang beautiful mahogany crosses on the halls, the walls of our churches. We, we wear shiny gold crosses around our neck. We put silver crosses and rings on our fingers. But the crucifixion, the, the cross is about death a horrible, horrifying, excruciating death. This crucifixion is from where we get the word excruciating. And John just says, here they crucified him and him with two others, one on each side, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. <laughs> you know, how I love the small phrases in the Bible and Jesus in the middle. Jesus in the middle between two criminals. Jesus is between justice and forgiveness. Jesus is between judgment and mercy. He is between penalty and pardon. He is between condemnation and salvation. He is the bridge between hell and heaven. For as Pilate has the truth posted on the cross over Jesus' head, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, in Latin, Aramaic, and Greek, so that the whole world would know. And Jesus utters his first word on the cross. We pick that up in Luke chapter 23, where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. I think Jesus embodies his teaching, his teaching to forgive others the same way that we have been forgiven, even when not even being asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel. Maybe that's why it's the first word that Jesus utters from the cross. It isn't deserved. It can't be earned. It's a gift freely given. Never, I think, never are we more like Christ than when we freely give the gift of forgiveness to someone who doesn't even deserve it. Jesus died and lived 
for you and me. The second word from the cross is also in Luke chapter 23. When one of the criminals hanging on the side of Jesus said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The criminal spoke of the future, but Jesus spoke of today. Today you will be with me in paradise. Giving grace to the undeserving believer based solely on his faith in who Christ is exemplifies what Jesus is, what John said about Jesus. In chapter 1, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. And this is the illustration of the word of God through Paul, where Paul writes in chapter 2 of Ephesians, for we are saved by grace through faith, this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast that he earns it. And these second words of Jesus on the cross give us comfort that as long as someone is alive, it's not too late to ask Jesus to be your Savior. Jesus saves today. The third word from Jesus on the cross is back in John chapter 19. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother there. And the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Mother, here is your son. Friend, here is your mother. Care for her. You, you know, I got to admit, if I were on the cross, I'd be looking for a way to get off or for sympathy or, or or to cry about the pain I was undergoing, but not Jesus. He is the one Paul described in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2 as not looking only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then from noon to 3 p.m. on that Good Friday, Jesus not only took our sins on his shredded back, but he became all our sins, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 23. God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us, for that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus became sin for us. And a holy and just God judged sin on the cross. And this was between God and the Paschal Lamb. We read in, in Matthew at chapter 27 at verse 45. From the sixth hour, that's noon, until the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., darkness came over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. This word for darkness is the Greek word ekleopo, E-K-L-E-I-P-O. This isn't an eclipse. It's not a dusky dusk. It's a complete absence of light. For the light of the world was being extinguished. And God, look, the Bible doesn't say this. This is... This is the way I picture this. This is the way I interpret these, these verses. I, I think that, that God took his cloak and he, he covered the world. And he, and he said, you may not watch this. As a holy God judged sin on the cross, as Jesus became that which he hated, sin. The embodiment sin. And for the only time in history, Jesus is separated from God. And he cried because 
the pain of spiritual separation is much worse than any physical pain that a man could endure. And so Jesus cries out with the fourth word from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Our words are written in Aramaic and they're translated for us, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think this is the only time that I can find that Jesus addresses his father as God. For although God turned his back on sin, I don't think the father ever, ever turned away from his son. I've read that Martin Luther went into seclusion for days to try to understand this verse. A friend of mine helped me understand this word. He said, when it's all about it's all about remez, R-E-M-E-Z, a, a form of speech, a form of, of literary speech that where one says one thing to remind the hearer, the listener, of even more. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? But, but Jesus' hearers know Psalm 22, and Jesus wants to remind them of all of the psalm, especially the way the psalm ends. For God has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. I think this is... This is a reminder to, to his readers, to his listeners, to his disciples that all is not lost, just the opposite. It's a reminder that after the cross, there is overcoming, there is freedom, there is victory, there is triumph. You know, history is crowded with Many men who would be God, but only one God who would be man. And Jesus, who is fully man, said, I am thirsty. I thirst, for I am fully man. We ask, where is God when this happens? Where is God when that happens? Where is God when we suffer? And Jesus says, I am here. I am here at the humiliation, I am here at the flogging. I am here on the cross for you. Jesus relates to our suffering and says, this too shall pass for I have overcome. Jesus lived and died for you and me. And the sixth word on the cross it's from John chapter 19, verse 30. After Jesus had received uh, a drink of, of wine vinegar, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. <coughs> Excuse me, it is finished. In a loud voice, in a shout of triumph, in a shout of victory, Jesus says, to tell us die, the Greek word means paid in full. It is complete. It is finished the debt is paid. The slave is freed. God's plan of redemption, Jesus' mission on earth, his purpose that he was born and for which he died is completed. And John tells us with that, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit we don't read that Jesus died. No, he voluntarily gave up his spirit. He voluntarily breathed his last breath of his own free will and said the seventh word from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit 
my spirit into your good hands. I trust my death and my life and my resurrection. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And I think God the Father entered the most holy place and sprinkled Jesus' blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, signifying that, that through the torn flesh of Jesus, all who follow him can enter into, boldly enter into God's presence. And we read that the earth shook and tombs were opened and the bodies of many holy and righteous ones were raised to life, signifying that Jesus is not only the life, but he is the resurrection. And the centurion who was eyewitness to it all, said, Surely this man was the Son of God. For greater love has no man than this, that he give up his life for his friends. For Jesus lived and died for you and me. So what? What do these seven words, these seven statements mean for us? Max Lucado says they mean my failures are not fatal. My life is not futile. My death is not final. As Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And as Jesus says, you will be with me. They're words of mercy and forgiveness. As Jesus says these words to such undeserving men, they mean as much to us. We are forgiven. As he became your sin and paid your penalty, he ensured your forgiveness, proving that your failures are not fatal. You are justified. As Jesus says, I thirst and I am not forsaken. Here is your brother. These are words of family and faith and fellowship. As Jesus says these words, we can know for sure that we are in his family to share in his suffering, yes, but also sharing in fellowship with his followers as our brother and sister and with his father as our father who will not forsake us. As the writer to the Hebrews quotes, God is saying, never will I forsake you, for he loves us unconditionally and gave his life for us. Don't you love Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where, where it says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Joy? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross? Could that joy be heaven? Could it be reunion with his Father? Yes, but I think it's more than that. I think the joy set before Jesus was you. You are the joy set before Jesus and for whom he endured the cross. Your life is not futile. You are being sanctified. And as Jesus says, it is finished. I commit my spirit to my Father. These are words of salvation. Jesus speaks words of triumph, of victory, of overcoming the world. And he promises that his followers also are overcomers who will join him in his father's house. Your death is not final. One day, as Jesus was, you will be glorified. Hmm. One more small set of words that I really love, the, the words that that described the disciple at the cross with the women, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh, I know theologians and commentators say, oh, that's, that's probably John. But I think it's interesting that it's, this disciple is not named. I'd like to speculate that this disciple is not given a name because this disciple whom Jesus loved is you. you. You are the disciple whom Jesus loves. You are the disciple 
that Jesus lived for and died for. So what do we do with Jesus' words? There once was a rather eccentric evangelist named Alexander Wooten who was approached by a flippant young man who asked, what must I do to be saved? Wooten replied, it's too late, and went about his work. The young man became alarmed. Do you mean that it's too late for me to be saved? He asked, is there nothing that I can do? Too late, said Wooten. It's already been done. The only thing you can do is believe. Will you say with the centurion at the cross, surely this man Jesus was the son of God and believe? Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for Jesus' words on the cross that are given to us that survived 2,000 years and are written for us to read and understand and take to heart. I pray, Father, that we would take each of his words to heart and that upon contemplating them and meditating them and believing them in our heart, we would trust Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We pray, Father, in his precious name. Amen.